Hello, everyone. My name is Jorge Reyes. I am the Education USA Advisor for Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Veracruz at the moment. Um, we welcome you to this regional webinar uh, called What I Am Grateful For as an International Student. Uh, please be noted that your microphone and your camera will be off during this presentation. If you have questions, you can send them to uh, Q&A Jenny Diaz. And we are also broadcasting on Facebook. So if you have any questions, you can uh, send them through the chat box on the Facebook uh, uh, transmission. And these will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, welcome again. And uh, before we start with this uh, regional webinar, I would like to take a moment to, to, talk, to, take, to, um, to tell you about Education USA. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, yeah, that one. Okay, what is Education USA? Well, Education USA is a global network of advising centers uh, from the U.S. State Department, uh, from the United, for, from the government of the United States. What what we do is we do advising services for those students that would like to pursue higher education in the United States. We do not work uh, uh, on on MOU with universities uh, from from the United States, but we work with more than 4000 universities that are that are in the states um our main intention our main goal is to provide accurate and comprehensive information for those students that would like to pursue uh, a higher education in the states uh you can find your nearest advising center in educationusa.state.gov uh, we are here in mexico we are uh, 26 centers but you can look for your closest advising center at this uh, web page. Um, our main target are students, high, high education institutions, governments, and NGOs. And uh, of course, all the information that we provide is free. So we don't charge anything for any of the information that we can uh, deliver. Um, many of our services, uh, because of the pandemic, were online as this regional webinar. Uh, but there are some um, fears that uh, are currently in some offices. Uh, uh, so you can look for those services as well. Um, and without further ado, I would like to present my peer, Ana del Arenal, Education ESA Advisor in Pachuca, Hidalgo. And she will be taking over of the interview with our three panelists. So, Ani. Thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you so much, Jenny, uh, Pau, Monse, Jonathan. As my colleague mentioned, today's event it's going to be a little bit out of the box. We want to have a fun and interactive event where Monse, Paulina, and Jonathan will share their experience, learnings, memories, and more as, as international students in the United States. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I will start by introducing our three guest speakers. Monse Carmona was born in Guadalajara, Mexico. She moved to the US when she was 12 years old, did her bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology at Houston Baptist University, since she wanted to study medicine. She is currently studying her master's in education also at Houston Baptist University. In her spare time, she enjoys helping others, volunteering, arts, and making connections with other students. We have Paulina, the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Paulina Bautista was born in Monterrey, currently studying an undergraduate degree in education at the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. She expects to graduate on fall 2022. She belongs to two or student organizations. And a fun fact about Pau is that she has been a senior since her second year of studies. And we also have Jonathan Gama. He is from Mexico City. He is studying a PhD in physics at Stanford. He was an Education USA grantee in 2020. A fun fact about Jonathan is that he plays several musical instruments. At some point, he thought about becoming a musician. Thank you so much, guys, for being here with us today. We will start with the questions. So first question. Can we go to the next slide, Jenny, please? Thank you so much. Okay, cool. 
Okay, so first question is, what was a challenge that you faced and what was a challenge you thought you were going to have and you did not? like when you arrive to the US or when you start classes. And you can also talk about the pandemic from last year and this year. What was your experience like? We are gonna start with Pau. Thank you very much. And well, yeah, there were like several challenges that I encountered, um, especially when I was first arriving over here to the US, which was on um, 2019. Probably the biggest shock for me was um, the time where people usually eat during the day, especially lunchtime and dinner time, because at least in Mexico, um, I don't know about you guys, but I was um, really used to having lunch at around maybe 2 or 3 p.m. and having dinner like way later at night. But um, over here, people tend to have lunch earlier at noon and dinner at 5 p.m., which was the weirdest thing to to me at first. <laughs> I remember during my first week of classes, um, there was someone telling me that they recommended me going to the cafeterias at really weird times of the day. So between 2 or 3 p.m. because nobody went there at that time. I was very confused and shocked. <laughs> yes. But I've learned to like have a, a balance um, and coordinate with my friends whenever we want to go and eat together somewhere. So now you, you go and have lunch or dinner at the same time as in the US people usually do there or, or still like in Mexico? It's kind of like a combination of both. Uh, probably through, um, during the weekdays, I usually have lunch a little bit earlier because it sort of matches my, um, my class schedule. But during the weekend, since I have like more free time and everything, I can take my time <laughs> to Good. eat um, at the times that I'm used to. Yeah. Okay. And something that you want to share about the pandemic from last year? How did it go? Oh, well, there was one sort of a big challenge that I um, faced when the beginning started, which is something that I never thought I would encounter. And that is housing insecurity, because it, it was kind of hard. Um, because, you know, when the pandemic first uh, came over here, um, people started late, um, moving out of their dorms. And my plan um, once the semester ended was going back home um, to spend vacations with my family and to live there because after all, it's my house, right? right. Um, but that was kind of impossible because you know international travel was not a good idea at that time. So there was a moment where I didn't know where to go, where was I going to live next? But luckily enough, I had um, several friends and relatives that were able to um, willingly receive me into their homes, uh, which is something that I'm super grateful for. Um, it, it's been crazy, like moving out from one place to another, yeah. but I'm just really happy that I have help and that I've always had like a place to stay at and I couldn't ask for anything better. That is so nice. Thank you so much, Pau. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to, to share your experience, your challenges? Sure, sure. Can you hear me now? Great. So, yeah, I mean, um, I found a couple of challenges, but probably the, the biggest one for me was to, to encounter with this different system of education, which is a little different from the one in Mexico. Uh, I, I found that there's more, more some sort of intellectual freedom. You have more liberty to do whatever you want. Uh, what I mean with this is that you can decide what classes you want to take. You can take classes from different departments, not only from your department, but also from other departments as well. Um, at least here in this university, you have the opportunity to make what they call rotations, which is kind of exploring different research areas before you decide where you are going to stay. So all that freedom felt uh, weird to me because I was not used to that. I was used to be told, uh, you have to take these classes, you have to do this work and, and that's it. So for me, that was uh, the, the biggest challenge at the beginning because I had no idea what I was going to do and I wanted someone to tell me what to do, but that's not the case here. So I remember that in one uh, meeting that we had, one of the professors said something like, we are bringing you here because you are all smart people. So we don't have to tell you what to do. And that really touched me. I was like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I can do this by myself. So since that moment, I think I started to trust more, more my own, uh, my own, my own gut and my own, um, 
ideas and, and really, really started pursuing my own uh, goals. So yeah, I think that was the main challenge for me at the beginning. Uh, another thing that I thought that I was going to struggle more with, but actually I didn't, was the, the academic background. Mm -hmm. I felt like probably I was not going to be like good enough as many of my classmates, because you know, you have people that comes from, I don't know, Harvard, MIT, and those schools that in a way are some sort of intimidating schools for me at least. So at the beginning, I had this kind of imposter syndrome and feeling that maybe I'm not going to be good enough. But with time, you take classes, you see your classmates, you talk to them, and you realize that, yeah, you can do it. You, you also have enough um, knowledge to, to take the class, to take the quizzes and everything. So yeah, I mean, time and knowing them helped me to overcome that challenge. And at the end, it was not a, a big challenge. I mean, I, I think I dealt with it very, very good. Right. You know, I, I think something you said something very important. I think we all have to trust our gut. Yeah. And that never fails. I, I believe that never fails. And uh, Monse, can you uh, share with us your challenges and, you know, experience with maybe if you want to share with the COVID situation? Yeah, so for me, it was a little bit different since I moved here when I was 12 years old. So I was basically pushed to learn the language. Like I didn't have any choice, like, oh, do you want, like my family just decided to move. It was, we came just for the summer and my mom was like, oh, we, we're staying. <laughs> like, we didn't even know like, she, like they were going to take the decision. So it was kind of different for me. And then like I did all my high school here. So I think I kind of adjust myself more to the culture. Like for example, for me, like as, as Paulina was saying, like the times of the eating, like I can see now when I go back to Mexico, like my family, they eat like at two or three. I'm like, I'm not even hungry at two or three. <laughs> but for me, I think the hardest part was actually learning the language. And I think like during the pandemic, because I went on November to Mexico and my, and I had to have an emergency surgery on December. So it was really hard because I had to stay there during the whole semester mm -hmm. and I was online. It was just crazy because I couldn't even, like I emailed my professors, but they didn't respond and sometimes like it was maybe the first time taking that professor. So it was really hard for me to communicate with them. So I basically mm -hmm. had to learn everything by myself during that semester. Yeah. Kind of like Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. Um, can we can we go to the next question, please? Thank you. Okay. How did you feel the first time you enter a class with people from different countries? And what are some of the cultural experiences you experience? Uh, can we start with Pau? All right, so I actually remember um, very vividly the first time that I um, was into an American classroom over here at the university. It was such a weird sensation. I remember it was um, a US history class um, very early in the morning. And my biggest surprise was that when I was entering into the classroom, I realized that I was going to take class with other 300 people, like within the same room. And I, it was just very shocking for me because I already knew that my university was a very big campus, but I just never expected to see like that amount of people um, in that class. And right after it ended, I went into a different class with approximately the same amount of students it was insane. I was like, wow, how do you people do this? Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was um, definitely one big surprise for me. And another thing, um, drawing back again on my first history class, it was, um, I don't know, I guess I also had like, less, like you mentioned, Jonathan, uh, sort of like an imposter syndrome, because it was the US history class. And so I had barely ever taken any sort of US history before, uh, before this course. And so I was thinking to myself like, oh my God, like this professor is going to expect me to know um, 
you know, at least the basics of US history. And I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle remembering the Mexican history. How am I going to know everything? But there's honestly um, so much support in the university. Um, if you reach out to the professor, they will be able to support you. There's also other resources out there. There's um, supplemental instruction classes, tutors, and everything is free by the university. So um, yeah, it was, at first it felt a little bit scary, but I got used to it eventually. Great, thank you so much. Monsek, what can you tell us about, uh, you know, cultural differences? For example, I feel that in Mexico, we hug and kiss people when we say hi. And I feel like that's something you should avoid in the US. I think it depends on the kind of people you hang out because there are a lot of American people that are actually like really emotional and like they are the ones that actually hug you <laughs> okay but yes it's really different because like i like i have friends from both sides like hispanic like not like not a lot of from mexico like they're like from venezuela or colombian mm -hmm. and i have also like people from here from other cultures and i think the culture that does less emotional things are the ones from asia like they're the ones that are more like they want their space like you cannot like hug them or kiss them like they're like in their own bubble and no one can go inside their bubble all right okay thank you so much and jonathan how how was your experience at a level of a phd like i feel it's different than an undergraduate for Pau. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of different because I'm taking some classes, but uh, you don't take like a class with your whole cohort. It's maybe some of them or, or not all of them at all. So it, it's quite different. But uh, I remember the first day of the quarter. Well, not the first day, the day before the first day of the quarter, uh, we had a, a little trip to the beach, like mm -hmm. all the cohort. And that day was very special to me because um, it was a very informal gathering. So we were all there just, you know, like uh, playing in the beach or having fun, having lunch, whatever. But um, that, that event uh, really touched me as well because I felt like we were all the same, even though we come from very different places, we all have very different stories, we have different interests. We were all there in the same place, having fun and just uh, interested in getting to know each other. So that little trip to the beach was very important for me. And I felt that that was my first day of classes with them. <laughs> the first day that I got to meet them and to know about uh, their previous research, their current research, and just that uh, kind of bizarre combination between people that is very intellectual and the beach environment, it was so special for me. So huh. that's what I can share from my first day with them. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then we have the next question is, what support or services did you receive to feel more welcome? Like, for example, maybe, I don't know if you want to talk about the international or admissions office. Did you have any counselor? Um, Pau, why don't you start? Of course. So actually, those um, the examples that you mentioned were exactly the ones I was going to talk about. Um, the first one is the UNT International Affairs Department. They, I swear that the people in the international office have been some of the nicest and most supportive people that I've ever met. And after all, it's um, it's understandable because they um, constantly deal with like international students coming in and they're familiar with um, all sorts of struggles that they might face along the way, especially at the beginning. So um, they have always made sure to like implement programs and um, sort of like student groups to gather and meet other international students. And it's just a beautiful experience because you get to meet other international students that may or may not be new to the university. And um, in the end of the day, they, they end up providing a uh, really nice space uh, where there's all sorts of cultural exchange and you end up making friends from all over the world. It's amazing. Um, and then the other resource is uh, on campus, we have counseling and testing services. 
where they can match you like with a counselor or therapist. Um, I feel like there's a lot of stigma around it, um, you know, that people think that you need to have a problem in order to go with them. But I mean, I reached out to them because um, since the very beginning of my first semester, because I was aware that um, as a new international student, uh, I was probably going to experience some sort of culture shock. And I just wanted to like have a resource to, um, to sort of like prevent it from happening or at least to lessen the impact. And I think it worked really fine because I was um, my first semester and all my semesters over here in general have been very manageable. And yeah, my, uh, my counselor has always been like super supportive towards me and they are very understanding about your experiences. Yes. That is so nice. Okay. And Monse, what about you? Did you receive any support? I know you started very young, but apart from having your parents there at school, maybe your teacher. Yeah. So like when I came, I entered a program that is called newcomers and they just accept like people that they don't know any English. Like you just start from the basic. They only teach you English, English or English and math. So we basically they just focus all your attention to learn the to learn the language. Mm -hmm. But also it was hard for me that transition from high school to the university because like my family didn't know. I when my counselor I remember in high school she told me, "Oh, you're a junior, you have to do the SAT." I'm like, "What is the SAT? I didn't have any idea." So like I know like also like choose HBU for the main reason because it's really small campus and like you get to know everyone and your professors usually know you mm -hmm. so I like that because like on my I'm like my international advisor like also helped me a lot and she has connected me to a lot of people who can help me like if she doesn't know then she connects me to the right person who can help me and I like that. I also like that they actually know your name. Like, because I, I know in a lot of big universities, like, you're just a number for them. Mm -hmm. I like with this one, like, they actually, like, when you go, like, when you walk in the hallways, they actually say hi and they say your name to you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And Jonathan, what about you? Since you are starting a PhD, did you receive any support or services? Yes, uh, at the beginning of the of the quarter, we have two um, orientation weeks. And I believe those orientation weeks were very important for me. Uh, the first one was more about uh, general administrative procedures for the university, uh, things related also with uh, the visa, uh, with the credits that you have to take, um, more like general information for international students. And that was very important because there are many things that you don't know that you have to do, but you have to do it. <laughs> it's good to know uh, all those things. And the second orientation week was more uh, specifically oriented to the physics department, which is where I am. And that was also uh, very good to, to have that opportunity to know about uh, how many credits you have to take each quarter, uh, what are the milestones for your research, when you have to start thinking about graduation and all that uh, timeline that is important for you to have in, to bear in mind. So those two orientation weeks were very important, but also another resource that I find very uh, useful is that they give you a, a mentor, which is another PhD student, but let's say in a higher uh, year of his career. Mm -hmm. So he can also give you some advice more like on a grad life level. So he has been very helpful uh, for me talking about, let's say, how to get around in the city, uh, get to know more about uh, social life in the city. I don't know where to get groceries, stuff like that. That is more about your daily life as a graduate student. All so right. Those are the resources that I, I have found the most useful. Nice, thank you so much. Can we go to the next question, Jenny, please? Thank you so much. Okay, in what clubs, students, associations, or extracurricular activities have you participated in your US institution? Um, how have this experience helped you face any cultural challenges? Or maybe we would like to know if you have started a club at your university. 
Can we start with Monse? Because I do know you participate in a lot of clubs and activities with HBU. Yeah, so I was like on my undergrad, I was part of the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And it was really helpful because when we w went to the neighborhoods, most of the people, they only spoke Spanish. So I was basically like, we were only three people in the whole club that spoke Spanish. So like I was, like I felt really comfortable because I was able to translate and help all those people in need. Right now that I'm on my master's, um, because I'm doing the master's in education, I'm doing, I'm basically like in a group where the teachers go and we go volunteer to different elementaries. And mm -hmm. uh, I like it because also like, I like, I prefer to go to the, what's it called? I forgot the name, like the lowest income elementaries yeah, where yeah. most of the parents, like they cannot help their children because they don't know how to write or how to read. So it's really hard for them to teach their kids how to read and write if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that right now and I'm just in that transition. Very nice. Thank you so much. Jonathan, what about you? Have you joined any club while studying PhD? I know it takes a lot of time for you to like, it's already taking you a lot of time to like to study and all that. Maybe, maybe. have you joined any club? Uh, yes. Well, here's the thing. When you apply for a PhD and probably also for undergraduate, you provide some uh, demographical information. So here, as soon as you start, uh, you are contacted by some organizations that have to do with your demographic background. So as soon as I started, I, I was uh, reached out by some of the organizations of uh, Latinx students, Mexican students, international students. So all those organizations started to send me information about their events and uh, in general, all the activities that they hold. So. I started attending to some of them, and that's pretty much what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes I go to their events, and it's a good way to get to know other graduate students, which uh, also share your, your background, your stories. And it has been helpful for me, as, as this last question says, of how this experience has helped me to face any cultural challenges. I remember uh, one week when I was feeling uh, really homesick, and I was like, oh, I miss my country and my city and everything. And all of a sudden I got a mail from the Mexican association and they say something about, yeah, yeah we're gonna host a party tonight. Come on and welcome. And we'll have, we're gonna have a, a mariachi playing. So I was like, yeah, that's what I need today. So I went and I um, watched the mariachi playing and everything, it was so much fun, but also made me uh, feel better. Uh, despite that that week I was feeling particularly homesick so yeah it has been helping me a lot to to face this cultural change so nice it's not all about studying you also need to sure. have some fun exactly. for sure exactly. and Pau what about you yeah so I do belong to um a few student organizations so um Officially, like there's two um, organizations that I'm part of and that I'm actually part of uh, their officer board. So the first one is called Capital Tapai. Um, the name can be a little bit deceiving. It may sound like it's a sorority, but in reality, it's um, an honor society, which is sort of like a professional organization uh, related to my major, in this case, education. So I'm the vice president of this organization and uh, we pretty much organize events related to professional development for future teachers. Um, we usually invite panelists, do um, a few service activities for other education majors. And it's really fun and it's really nice because you have like a space to gather with other people that are very passionate about the education field as much as you are. Um, and I love it. And I love the rest of the officers in my team. Um, the other organization that I'm an officer of is called World Echoes, which is an international organization um, that pretty much what we do is promote um, internationality and just gather like people from different countries to give them like a space 
to you know just know more about different cultures in different countries. We sometimes organize um, artistic events, and we also try to like look around for restaurants in the area where we can um, find like authentic food from different countries, which is something really hard to do when you're um, not in your home country. <laughs> And it's really nice. And I've also been involved in a few other extracurricular activities. One of them is the, it's called the Undergraduate Student Library Advisory Board. And pretty much what we do is uh, we work along with the libraries from the university to give feedback on the services that they offer. We also organize events at the end of the semester to kind of like invite people to relax and come over here to um, well, relax before finals. Mm -hmm. And another um, sort of activity that I've been involved in is called the Conversation Partner Program, which is administered by the Intensive English Language Institute that we have over here. Um, so my role in there is that I am a mentor for students that, are, that come over here to learn English. We usually meet uh, once a week, and I help them to practice their um, conversational skills, which is really nice. I just, um, if you cannot tell already, I just love being involved with the international community. Um, yes. It's amazing. I it is amazing really nice. Experience. And Pau, I'm going to invite you because you know some advisors, we have conversations club. So if you like to participate, we can invite you to one of our sessions. Of course, I would love to join sometime. Great. Okay, let's go to the next, please. Next, okay. Which U.S. traditions have you adopted? <laughs> have you been part of a Thanksgiving celebration? And I'm going to start with Jonathan. We want to know, Jonathan, we want to know, guys, if you are going to celebrate Thanksgiving this year, like this Thursday, will you cook something? Is there something that you really enjoy having from, you know, all the dishes that they prepare? Sure. Well, um, I feel like... Until this year, I started uh, really adopting uh, Halloween. <laughs> it's not something that I was used to, to celebrate, but I read a little about the story of the celebration here in the United States. I found it interesting. And also the, the parties that they do around it are also very fun. So I was like, okay, probably I'm gonna start celebrating um, Halloween from now on. So yeah, that's one thing that I have adopted. Maybe another thing is the, the passion for football, American football, which is something that I, I also never like it at all. I never watch it an entire game, but I actually this uh, Sunday, I went, no, this Saturday, I went last Saturday, I went to a, a game here and it was so much fun to see all the, the same, the party and the celebration that, it, that happens around the game is also very interesting. So that's something that I'm also starting to, to appreciate. And yes, I've been part of a Thanksgiving celebration before. I was um, an exchange student here in California as well, but in UC Davis uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and that was like the first time that I celebrate Thanksgiving. And I really like the concept of the celebration because it doesn't have to do anything with, with a particular religion. It doesn't have to do anything with, let's say the new year. It's just almost like a random day when you stop and acknowledge the good things that have happened to you. And you are grateful for that. You express that gratitude. And I find that very, very important, very special. Maybe more in these times that we have lived that are very, well, that have been quite complex. I think it's important for us to stop for a minute, uh, reflect on all the things that have happened and acknowledge that life is good sometimes, right? So. I think that's the, the philosophy in general of the celebration, and I really like that. And yes, this year I'm celebrating Thanksgiving uh, with some friends. We are going to have our own Thanksgiving uh, dinner here in campus, so I'm looking for that uh, for Very the nice. Thursday. Yes. Oh, cool. Send us some pictures, please. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, Monse, what about you? Since you went to the US in like a very young age, did you at some point like adopt the Thanksgiving celebration? Yes, I did. And I didn't do it like on my first years. I, I actually done it until I was, I was an HBU because in international, they have a survey where you can fill it out and 
like a family adopts you it like it basically adopts you for the whole year like you just go there for dinner or and they invite me to one on Thanksgiving I think it was my first one because I didn't usually celebrate like with turkey and everything is uh like I did that on Christmas like not on Thanksgiving and it was really fun I love the pumpkin pie I don't know why it just like it's the mixture between like it's sweet with salt. It's just, it's just perfect for me. Nice. Th thank you so much. Pao, what about you? Yeah. So during the past uh, two years, I've had, well, not the past two years, my first year and this year, um, the UNC Division of International Affairs has organized sort of like an international Thanksgiving dinner on which pretty much what they do is invite um, well the international students at UNT to gather at a Thanksgiving dinner organized by the university specifically for international students and they have pretty much like all the traditional dishes that you can imagine like the turkey um, green beans mashed potatoes and it's really nice like it's food I feel like there's always this stereotype that university food or college food is um, not as good, but honestly, they go above and beyond um, for these kinds of events. It is a lovely experience. Um, I'm, like every time of the year when it's like, um, when we're getting closer to Thanksgiving, I'm, that's like the one thing that I'm the most looking forward to. <laughs> it's a really fun time. Um, and also during, during the past two previous years, um, I've had like a few friends inviting me towards uh, like for Thanksgiving dinner with their families. Unfortunately, there's always been like something coming up and I, for some reason, cannot make it. But this year I will be celebrating Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day uh, with a few of my friends over there in the Houston area. I'm going to be nearby. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's going to be really exciting. Um, they, uh, my friends, their siblings, and honestly, their family has felt almost like a second family for me. And I'm really, really, really looking forward to it. <laughs> Great. Also, guys, send us some pictures from your, you know, your celebration, Monte and Pau, too, please. And we have two more questions. Okay, the next one is, what are you grateful for as an international student in the United States? Like, um, I feel like these times we, because of the COVID and the pandemic, we'll learn a lot, like to be really thankful for what we have. So can you share your experience with us? I'm going to start with Monsi. Yes, like I think I'm pretty grateful for the opportunities the U.S. brings to you. Why for, the, it's not just for you to grow personally, but also because a lot of people say, oh, you come here because like, you can have a better life and it's economically better. But I don't think that, like, I know you need to have money to live, but I don't believe is the main point. Like, I like it too, because you can actually grow. Like I have, I have been growing personally too, because mm -hmm. I have been experiencing like different cultures and also adjusting myself to different kinds of people which I know in Mexico, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. like you have to be like in a country where a lot of people come and like, it's just basically a mixture of everything. Yes, totally. But uh, what can you share with us? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to say that, that I really agree with what you said, Monse. Um, it's just really amazing. Um, you know, when you take a moment to step back and realize like, wow, like there's so like a lot of access to many things over here, like so many experiences that I would never have had, had I not um, come over here to study in the United States. Um, it just has created for me like a space for a lot of personal growth. Um, and it's insane. Like I look back to a few years when I was still in high school and I feel like I'm, I was a completely different person, right? Um, but I've changed in a good way. So that's one thing that I'm really grateful for. Um, I'm also very grateful to be at a university that has been very caring about me and very supportive um, towards like, you know, the whole international community. I, it's really nice that 
to know that I'm studying in a place where I'm getting the best preparation to become a teacher. And that is constantly giving me um, some excellent resources to excel in my future career as an educator, which is something that I'm really looking forward to. And last but not least, I'm also very grateful to be surrounded by some of the most wonderful people that I've ever met. Um, and I'm talking about pretty much everyone, um, my friends, my professors, um, the staff over here at International Affairs, um, my coworkers, um, they are like, like I said, the nicest people I have ever met. And I know that without their support and their friendship and the connection that I have with them, I probably would not be here where I'm at right now. Right, exactly. And Jonathan, finally, can you share with us? Sure, yeah, I, I totally agree with both uh, Pauline and Monse. Uh, I'm grateful for, for being here, for this opportunity of pursuing my PhD in this university, uh, for belonging in a way to this place now. That's also something that, that I'm grateful for. Um, I'm grateful for the people that surrounds me as well, my, my classmates, my professors, all the academic staff is also uh, very, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And as Paulina said, I, I also cherish the, the changes that I have experienced in these few months that I've been here. I think that all those changes have been uh, for good. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that as well. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. And finally, we have our last question. That is, um, Okay, do you have any advice for students who will study in the United States so they can adapt better to the culture? Maybe if you can think of like when you started your process and you were about to go to the US and maybe you thought of, oh, I should have brought this or that, apart from maybe food or candies, but maybe something that you can recommend our students that are, that are applying like for studying in the US. I'm going to start with Pau. Yeah, so um, in regards to things to be prepared of, um, sort of like to bring when coming over here um, to the US and that will help you to adapt to the culture is, um, well, I can think of, for example, I brought a, a traditional dancing outfit from my state, Nuevo Leon. Um, at first, it sounds like a waste of space when, especially if you're traveling by um, by airplane, um, because you know there's like a lot of restrictions. But oh my god, I've used it like so many times over here during the past years, um, and it, it's just like something that will come up eventually at some point. Um, I brought like a Mexican costume and the Mexican hat. That will probably be too much because it's too bulky. But uh, <laughs> I absolutely recommend it. Um, I just really love wearing it for um, any cultural events that come up or events relating to Mexico. That's one thing. On the other hand, like other advice that I would give um, to adapt to the culture is, first of all, don't be afraid of trying new things and stepping out of your comfort zone. I feel like at first, um, before starting my program over here in the US, I used to be um, like very reluctant towards like activities organized by the school, by my high school, for example. Uh, I was always like the person that was like, mm, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> but now over here, it's like um, whenever there's something coming up, like either an event or a party or something, I'm always the first person to, um, <laughs> so let's go. to agree to go, yes. Um, and that's also tied up to my next point, which is um, remembering that there's more in life than studying. Um, it's also very important to have fun and, and like they say, live the college experience as much as you can, because yes, school is a priority and that's pretty much probably the main reason for which people are interested in coming to study to a different country in the first place. Um, but it's always important to like try to not miss out on other things um, because they can, you know, there's so many things that can happen, so many good things that you can get out of it. And another tip that I would give is talking to people. Don't be scared to talk to others, especially during your first year. Um, 
at first I was very shy because I was like, oh my God, like everyone is from here from Texas. They probably all know each other. But the reality is that everybody's looking for friends. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, if you talk to people, um, even if you just walk to them and start um, having like random conversation, you, you may make good friends out from that. So <laughs> I absolutely recommend it. Great. Thank you so much for those tips, Pao. Monse, can you share with us any advice, tips, recommendations? Yeah, like I kind of agree with some of what Pao said. I will recommend for them to be open um, as far as them to think outside the box. It's not like just be in your own bubble, like open yourself to actual opportunities because as Paulina was saying, like you only leave once and you cannot just get stuck on like your study. So I have to do this. Like you have to leave. You have to have experience outside the, your classes. So just to be open and have fun. And like, if you work hard, like whatever, I think, like I have always grow with that because my mom always, since I was a little girl, she always told me like, whatever you dream, if you work hard and if you're constant, like you're constant, you'll be able to achieve them. So okay. it's just my advice for all those students that are trying to come to the United States. Thank you so much, Monse and Jonathan. Uh, well, my advice will be for them to, to be ready for change, to have a, an open mind and embrace uh, all the challenges and changes that are going to come up uh, while they're studying here in the United States. I will say not to be afraid of those changes, but embrace them, uh, get the best from them. Also to cherish diversity and most important also uh, to reach out to all the support that they need, even though if that's uh, administrative support or counseling support or whatever kind of support they need, always reach out to, to people that can provide you with that um, support. And talking about uh, physical things that I brought with me, um, I brought some books that are very important to me. So there are like three or four books that really, I think uh, are some sort of my literature Bible, Mexican Bible. <laughs> and, those have been very important to me. When I feel also homesick or that I'm a little lost, I, I go to those, I go back to those books, read a little and feel again, like in my, in my path. So yeah, that's what I will recommend. Nice. So guys, I wanna know, did you like specifically for Pau and Jonathan, because you are the ones that started like a short like time ago, did you take to the US any candies or food with you? Yes? Because I know, for example, Monse, I know that in, in Texas, there's this supermarket called Fiesta and you pretty much find anything you can think of as, a, as in Mexican stuff, right? Um, there's also a store called La Michoacana where you can find like all the food and all the candy. It's just more expensive. But like every time I go to Mexico, like you can see my suitcase is probably full with candies. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Pau, did you did you take anything with you? Of course I did. <laughs> so the candies, I mean, I, I think I brought like some of my favorite candies, which include pica gomas and pica fresas. I just love them. And I just um, I really like giving uh, sharing them with my friends, um, especially those who are not used to like spicy candy. That's another shock that I had. I did not know that Americans did not have spicy candy. So when I showed it to them, they were like, what? I had no idea this existed. <laughs> I brought those. I brought uh, tamarinds. I brought, I think it was um, obleas, glorias. Um, Pulpa, and I love them. And it's, and it's not necessarily like for me, but also to like share with people. Because what's the point of it if, you know, you're not going to share it? <laughs> exactly. And Jonathan, did you take anything with you? Actually, I didn't because I have been here in, in California before and I knew I was going to find everything I wanted. So there's a big Mexican population in here. You find pretty much whatever you need. So no, I didn't bring anything like, like that, but I can find them here. <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool, guys. Thank you so much for your time. This was the 
last question. It was such a pleasure to have you with us. And finally, we're gonna have this uh, information for people watching us. If you have any questions regarding our guest speakers, regarding the process for Education USA, you can contact us and send an email through Mexico at educationusa.org. And we invite you to follow us on social media. We also have a really, really, really great blog that has a bunch of information and resources. And that's the end of our you know, event. Thank you so much, guys. Um, Jenny, can you stop the presentation?